Freedom is a 12-week uh, small group study that explores breaking free from things in life that may be holding you back from a deeper relationship with God and Jesus and others. In the beginning, there was a video, and it gave me um, like a deeper understanding of the beginning of Scripture, you know, when uh, God created earth and talking about good versus evil and the tree of life. Now, what I want to point out in this part of the story is, is that Satan's attempt to derail your life isn't always to get you to do bad things. In this particular case, he's actually appealing to her desire to be godly. He says, oh, come follow me and you'll be more like God. And I say that to say that even in church, we can follow the wrong approach. Even in our pursuit of God, if we do it the wrong way, it's not necessarily the, 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 the way that God intended for our lives. He says, you know, you'll be like God, but you won't have God in you. No, you'll just know good from evil. And so that was really intriguing to me. I came to understand the Bible a little bit differently. And so then I just wanted more. I was able to kind of relate that to some of the things in my life that maybe I experienced too young as a child, making friends with the world in areas of like bitterness or gossip. Experiencing those things really led to areas of my life that felt dead. Relationships that I felt maybe were kind of gone forever. I was able to really take a look at those and realize that they were affecting me more than I thought they were and work through kind of letting that stuff go. You've got to make the choice to, to forgive, but truth be known, <laughs> people who are carrying around unforgiveness honestly are just destroying your own life. And can I just look into the camera and look into you guys' eyes and say, you're not hurting them. When you hold it against them, you think you're punishing them. No, you're really not. So I heard someone say, unforgiveness is like setting yourself on fire and hoping your enemy burns from smoke inhalation. What, a, what an amazing picture. I'm, I'm going I'm to make you die with smoke, and I'm gonna, to do that, I'm going to set myself on fire. That, it really, unforgiveness doesn't destroy the person near as much as it destroys you. I would say that would be the big area that freedom really helped me to deal with. It kind of just walks you through, step by step, how to get through some of those things that, like I said, I didn't even realize that. When I started the group, I didn't have like all these things I need freedom from. I was free. I've been following Jesus for a long time. I'm free. I know that to be true, but it was, there were things that came up that I was really thankful that I was able to pay attention to. Learning what truth is, is part of that process. Being able to repent from it, and then not go and pick it up again. You know, put it behind you. If you are considering going through freedom, prepare to be surprised at what you'll get out of it. Prepare to put something into it. It's intense, it's emotional, it's joyful. It's fun, it's worth it. Diane is right. If you have not had a chance to go through the Freedom Curriculum, it is worth it. And I hope that this video, along with, you'll see a couple more of these in the coming weeks, the stories that you hear of people who have gone through this process and come out different, come out healthier, come out more free, even those of us who have been Christians maybe our whole lives, I hope as you hear these stories, you'll sign up and you'll see what it's about because it is worth it. I love, love that final slide in that video that says freedom starts soon. Because to me, that's not just an obvious statement about our freedom groups that are starting soon. You walked in this morning, you saw the evidence, all of our small groups are starting soon. But I think that's a prophetic statement of what the Lord is about to do in all of us. Freedom is coming. There is a greater amount of abundant life that he has for us. Regardless of where you are now, regardless of how lost, how broken, or how healthy, 
and perfect things might seem, there's more. He has more for every one of us. And I think you saw that this morning in what Pastor Josh already shared, that we're sensing, your, your prayer team, your staff, your pastors, we're sensing that the Lord is about to do something more. He's, we're just on the cusp of something big that he's about to do. He's stirring us up and we can feel it in worship and we can feel it in prayer and we can feel it as we read the word. But there's something that we've got to do to step into what he has. And that's what we're going to be talking about this morning. A few weeks ago, the pastors and staff, we took a retreat to Leavenworth and we stayed a couple nights there. And the purpose of that was really just to pray and cast vision over what God wants to do in our church this coming season, this coming year. And part of what we were asked to do by Pastor Josh was for each of us to just take some time and pray, take some time to ask the Lord individually, God, what's a, what's a prophetic word? What's a scripture that you have for what you want to do in our church body? And then we came together during that retreat and we shared what, what God had shared with each one of us. And as each of us began to share, it was amazing to see how they all tied together. Some of us heard things about being deeply rooted. Some of us heard things about being more fruitful. Some of us heard things about being well watered, but all of it had this planting or this gardening theme. And eventually, as we continued to share, Pastor Josh started to, on the whiteboard in front of us, he started to kind of sketch a picture of a tree. And if you know anything about Pastor Josh's artistic ability, you know that it almost looked like a tree. <laughs> It was a beautiful representation of what God is doing and is going to keep doing. And it's very well described in what's going to be our key scripture verse for this morning, our key passage. And it's really the passage I'm going to be coming back to as the theme for our 21 days of prayer as well. So the scripture is Jeremiah 17, verses 7 and 8. And I'm going to just go ahead and read that right now in the New Living Translation. But blessed are those who trust in the Lord and have made the Lord their hope and confidence. They are like trees planted along a riverbank with roots that reach deep into the water. Such trees are not bothered by heat or worried by long months of drought. Their leaves stay green. And they never stop producing fruit. The prophet Jeremiah in this passage is saying much of the same thing that the psalmist also said in Psalm 1, verse 3. That says, The person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither, whatever they do prospers. So if we apply the description that's in both of these passages to our own lives, look at the picture of the kind of person that we get. Someone who is firm and secure, having a consistent source for nourishment and refreshment, healthy enough to have a fruitful life, having enough to give away without depleting ourselves or withering, and having the confidence that in all we do, we will prosper, we'll be okay. That to me, that picture of a tree is the picture of an abundant life. It's the picture of freedom. It's what we as your pastors are praying for and what we will be contending for, for all of us during this 21 days of prayer and, and further on. As we begin our three-week sermon series on freedom this morning, we're going to unpack this morning these scriptures, looking at what it looks like to truly have an abundant life. An abundant life in today's message I'm going to be referring to as being free and fruitful, because that's what we see in that picture of a tree. I'm going to give you a spoiler of today's message, the end thing that I want you to take away, and it's that 
you get to have this kind of life. You get to be free and fruitful. Jesus said, I came that you may have life and have it abundantly in John 10, 10. So it's a promise. God has abundant life ready and waiting for you. But we have to step into it and walk it out. So what does that mean? What does that mean that we have to step into it and walk it out? Well, Jesus paid the price. We, we understand that. We took communion this morning. We remembered what he did for us. So we don't have to earn this abundant life. He did that. But there are some best ways to live, some best practices to stay planted in that abundant life. And that's what we're going to look at this morning. Some best practices that are for our good, practices that will help us stay in the freedom that he bought for us. But before we dive into that, I do just want to pray over our time and over the words that, that God wants to say this morning. Lord Jesus, Holy Spirit, I thank you for already preparing the ground this morning. I thank you for already tilling the soil. I thank you that when we walked in, your Holy Spirit was already here. And that we don't have to do anything. I don't have to do anything this morning to make something happen that you've already done and that you're already planning to do. But Lord, I pray that you would use my words, that they would reflect your heart and that they would reflect your truth and that they would land in the places they're supposed to land, Lord that your words would land in good soil in people's lives and that we would see a new amount of blooming and a new amount of health and a new amount of freedom. I thank you, Lord, in advance for what you're going to do. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So let's look at this picture of a tree. If we look back at that Jeremiah passage and at that first psalm, we see, before we see anything else, a theme of being planted by water. So to be free and fruitful, it must mean that we need to be planted like a tree by water. Jeremiah says, like trees planted along a riverbank. And the psalmist says, like a tree planted by streams of water. So I feel like today we know water is a really big deal. Water is trendy. I mean, it didn't used to be as big of a deal, I feel like, as it is today. It's like kale. It's like alfalfa sprouts. It's like really healthy things that you're supposed to eat. And I feel like we're a little behind the times. Like, we just kind of caught on to that a few decades ago. Because when I was a kid, water was not as big of a deal. We didn't have to bring a water bottle to school. We didn't leave home and worry about, do I have my water bottle? Just like we worry about, do I have my phone? Do I have my keys? Do I have my water bottle? It's like on the checklist, don't leave the house without it. When I was a kid, we were very well stocked in some drinks, like juice and milk. And if we were really lucky, chocolate milk or Kool-Aid mix or ice mix, like this gross powder that you would dissolve in water and it would make Lipton iced tea. I don't know why, but we were always well stocked in that. But water, not so much, not so much. I mean, we'd drink it if we were parched. If we had to drink it, we would drink it. Honestly, usually if we were drinking it, it meant it was the end of the month and we were waiting for more grocery money to go buy the good drinks. But we didn't drink it by choice. We didn't drink it like the life source that it is. And maybe that's just my family. But most people, people who are tuned into health, know, and certainly people in other nations, know that water is life. In the Bible, we see water as a theme woven throughout Scripture from start to finish. It's in almost every story as a main character, it's the site for many encounters between God and his people. And part of that is practical because the Bible mostly takes place in desert-like climates where it's hot and dry and water is absolutely crucial to life. But the significance of water goes deeper than the physical. In the Bible, water often represents the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God. 
John 7, 37 through 9, Jesus shares this. If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. By this, Jesus spoke concerning the spirit whom those believing in him would receive. Think about the benefits of water, the things that we do with water, the things we get from water, things like washing, cleansing, soaking, refreshing, quenching of thirst, filling up. Water is the source of life, just like the Holy Spirit is all that we need for life. Recently, my family, just this last week, we went to the Oregon coast for a vacation. And honestly, the moment that I approached the water, something shifted in my spirit. Things started to just settle and fall into place. I started to feel calmer, breathe more deeply. There's something almost supernatural, maybe actually supernatural, about water. There's a reason that the Lord created it. There's a reason it's so healing. And there's a reason that it represents the presence of God. Being planted near water, as the scripture describes, it means remaining close to the spirit of God. We need to soak in him, fill up with him before we try to pour out. And there are a lot of practical ways to do this. We can soak in worship. We can have it playing in the background while we're driving or doing other things around the house. We can just sit and soak in his presence, just being with him or waiting to see if he wants to speak to us, sitting in silence with him. But the best way to soak in the presence of God is to access the sword of the spirit of God, which is the word of God. We see that also reflected in that first psalm, that in Psalm 1, verse 2, right before we hear about being planted by streams of water, we see the psalmist say this, that we need to delight in the law of the Lord, meditating on it day and night, delighting in it, meditating on it, soaking in it. We're made to actually drink in the word of God, to soak it in. But we don't always know how thirsty we are, right? We don't always know until it's too late. Have you ever been at the end of your day and it's almost bedtime and suddenly you find yourself guzzling down water because you didn't drink it throughout your day? So now it's like time for bed and great. Now I'm drinking all this water and I'm going to be up 10 times tonight to go to the bathroom. But what can you do? I waited too long. The same is true about God's word. We wait too long. We don't realize we need it. We think we're fine without it. Maybe something else sounds better to drink. Something else sounds better to read. Something else sounds better to do. And then we find, oh my goodness, I haven't been drinking it and now I'm parched. I don't have the refreshment and the hydration that I need to get through because I haven't been storing it up. We need to soak in the word of God. We're made for communion with him, just like we're made for water. So to be free and fruitful, we need to stay planted near a water source, near his spirit. To be free and fruitful, we also need to allow the Lord to prune us, to prune dead and unneeded things. John 15, 2 Jesus is speaking again, and he says, Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he, meaning the father, the master gardener, he takes it away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes it so that it may bear even more fruit. So the Lord, the master gardener, he not only cuts away the dead things, but he also cuts away some things that might look really pretty, some things we really like, some of our favorite branches, because they're extra. They're not helpful or beneficial, and they're getting in the way. So first, those dead things. If you're a gardener, you know that you need to, at the end of the season, 
deadhead things. So you deadhead, like we deadhead our rhododendron plants, which don't drive by my house and look at my rhododendron plants. We're trying our best, but they're not the best. I'm not a master gardener. But you pinch off the dead parts or you pinch off the dead blooms on a plant throughout the season. And you do this, you cut off the dead branches, pinch off the dead blooms so that there's more space for the healthy branches to do what they need to do to bear life either in the current season or in next season. What dead or fruitless things are you allowing to stay present in your lives that the Lord might want to prune? Maybe unforgiveness or bitterness, selfish ambition. There are a lot of things. Fear, time-wasting habits. The truth is that Regardless of who we are, we all carried in a few dead things with us this morning. Things that the Lord still needs to do some work in. Things he still needs to prune. I like to imagine, what if all the secret things in here, those dead thoughts, those things that are not fruitful, were out for everyone to see? That uncharitable thought that flipped through your mind or that mean joke that you kind of snickered at, or maybe a piece of gossip, or a past hurt that we've been nursing. What if those things were on display? We would be horrified, right? But even though we can't see those things, there's a stench. They smell, just like dead things smell. What I mean by that is that you can still feel those things in the atmosphere. There's something that happens that you can sense in the spirit. So those attitudes, those private thoughts, they come across in our faces or they might even come out in our words. They might slip out or on our countenance or in our tone of voice. Regardless of how we sense them, they do change the atmosphere of the spaces that we inhabit. They matter. When you walk into a room, does that room get brighter or darker? When people encounter your presence, do they feel better about themselves or do they feel worse? Does your spirit smell good or does it smell like there's too many dead things that haven't been pruned away? We have to cut away the dead things, but we also have to allow the Lord to prune the extra things. So my tomato plants are an example. My tomatoes suffered for many years because I didn't know enough about pruning until my father-in-law, who's a master gardener, he's incredible. He came and he said, you're not, you're not cutting away the suckers the way you need to. You're not peeling off the suckers. And the suckers are these tiny little branches. They're awfully cute. It makes me sad to cut them away. But they're, they're tiny, and they've got little flowers on them a lot of times, blooms. Like, there's going to be tomatoes on there. Or they even have tiny green buds of tomatoes that are already beginning to grow. But there are so many of them that if you don't prune or peel them away, then there's not enough energy and light and space and nutrients and water that can't get to where it needs to on those main, big, healthy branches that are made to hold the most fruit. So you have to be meticulous about pruning all the cute little suckers. So what cute little suckers are in your life that need to be cut away? They might look really pretty. They might be bearing fruit. They might make you feel good about yourself. Maybe it's some extra relationships or extra jobs, side gigs. Whatever the suckers may be, God will be faithful to reveal the extra things to you. He'll give you the discernment to tell what is primary right now and what needs to be pruned. And then he'll give you the courage to cut away the things that need to be cut away to allow him to do the work of pruning that needs to be done. And let me tell you, without all that extra, you will have so much more life and energy and space 
to give to the things that are made to bear the most fruit in this season of your life. You will have even greater abundance and fruitfulness. So to be free and fruitful, we have to stay planted near water. We have to allow the Lord to prune. And finally, we must be deeply rooted. We must be deeply rooted. Jeremiah 17, 7, from our main passage today, says like trees planted along a riverbank with roots that reach deep into the water, deep into the water. So we see this image of a tree that is deeply rooted. I was researching trees in preparation for this morning's message and was just finding out all this information about trees I've never heard of. And one of them that I came across was called, it's called the Jamin or the Java plum tree. And I'd never heard of it, but I immediately liked it because it has the word Java in it. And to me, coffee is life. <laughs> so the Java plum tree, which to my knowledge, although honestly don't quote me on it, I don't think it actually is related to coffee, but it has these fruits called Java plums and it grows in tropical countries like India, Pakistan, Nepal, or Florida. And not only is this tree long living and extremely strong and resistant to coastal winds, but its fruit, the java plum, has incredible life-giving properties. It's rich in iron and a lot of different vitamins, and it also is a natural blood purifier. It helps control high blood pressure and blood sugar. So we're all like wanting to find out how can we get the java plum. I'm going to call Candy Hagen. Send me some of those java plums. Can you guess what else this tree has that makes it so fruitful and so strong? Really deep roots. Incredibly deep roots. So you actually have to plant a java, java plum tree at least 30 feet or more away from any building or home because its roots will go so deep and so far that they'll ruin the foundation of any nearby facilities or buildings because the roots instinctively know that they have to go deep and they have to go far and they have to embed themselves in the soil to make them strong so those coastal winds can't knock them down and to make them fruitful. It searches for water, it searches for the nutrients that it needs by casting itself deep in the soil, by being deeply rooted. So for us, what does it look like to be deeply rooted? Well, it means we can't just stay on the surface. We have to be all in, in faith, all in and fully committed fully committed and rooted in Jesus, fully committed to serving in the places that we've been called to serve, fully committed to each other in relationships, and fully immersed in God's word. Too many of us are trying to live from Sunday to Sunday, subsisting on just about 75 minutes of spiritual sustenance a week, we're living, we're choosing to live in spiritual poverty when there's spiritual wealth at our fingertips. It's like living from paycheck to paycheck by choice when there's more that could be had. We need to be living in the abundant life that Jesus has made available. We just have to take hold of it. We have to step into that life by following these steps that he's laid out for us time and time again in scripture. If we will be faithful to stay planted near water, near the Holy Spirit, if we'll be faithful to let the Lord prune us of the extra and the dead things, and if we will stay deeply rooted in our faith Scripture says we will prosper in all we do. So what does that mean? What does it mean when Psalm 1-3 says, whatever they do prospers? Does it mean that every new business venture or financial risk will play out in our favor? 
Does it mean that every prayer we pray will come true? I wish, but I think we see in our own lives, as well as in scripture, that that's not the true meaning of prosperity. That's not what always happens, even to the most faithful of us. Jesus said it this way in John 16, 33. In this world, you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. Prospering, I think it speaks of something deeper and more permanent than earthly circumstances. I think spiritual prosperity means that we can have an untouchable, invincible spirit. When we're deeply rooted in God's spirit, when we allow him to prune away our fear, unforgiveness, and other bondage, then we, we get to this place where nothing can touch our peace. Financial or health or other struggles may come, and they will come, but our spirit is still able to thrive. It's that it is well with my soul kind of existence where we know that no matter what happens, God is still walking hand in hand with us and we're going to be okay. Spiritual prosperity, it's a visible serenity that overflows from a deep and well-watered relationship with Jesus. I'm going to say that one more time. Spiritual prospering is a visible serenity that overflows from a deep and well-watered relationship with Jesus. That is freedom. That is abundant life. And I want that for me. I want it for all of you. I want that for our church. As the worship team begins to play, I just want to give you a moment to reflect and to just process with the Lord and ask him, what is one thing that you want me to be more free in? One area in my life where I need more freedom and where God wants to do a miracle in your life. And I encourage you, don't think small. Don't limit what he can do. And what I want you to do this morning, if you walked in, hopefully you received a little prayer card like this. And if you didn't, you can grab a response card and jot it down on that. Or when you leave this morning, there are more of these on either side of the entrance, right by those prayer walls. But I want you this morning to take a moment and just write down in a couple words, what's that area the Lord is stirring up in you? An area where you want more freedom. Maybe it is just to be more free in worship or to be free from a certain struggle or area of bondage in your life that keeps creeping back in. Maybe it's freedom from a certain job or relationship or financial struggle. Whatever it is that the Lord brings to your mind, write it down. And then what I want you to do as you leave today is I want you to do one of two things. I either want you to clip it to one of those prayer walls that you'll see right outside the front entrance of the worship center. Or if you are watching online or if you don't feel comfortable putting it up for everyone to see, or if you're part of our Lilac campus, then I want you to plant it right in your Bible. And I want you to dedicate yourself to praying over it and looking at it every day for the next 21 days of prayer. Because as we make these prayerful supplications and declarations of what God is going to do and of what we want him to do, we're going to see miracles happen. We are going to see God do as many miracles as there are people in this room and as there are watchers online. I believe that. He is about to do big things in this church and in us as individuals. 
So as you're thinking, as you're jotting that down, I'm just going to read one closing passage of scripture. And I want you to just soak it in like the water that his scripture is supposed to be. It's Psalm 92, verses 12 through 15. Look how you've made all your devoted lovers to flourish like palm trees, each one growing in victory, standing with strength. You have transplanted them into your heavenly courtyard where they're thriving before you. For in your presence, they will still overflow and be anointed. Even in their old age, they will stay fresh, bearing luscious fruit and abiding faithfully. Listen to them. With pleasure, they still proclaim, you're so good. You're my beautiful strength. You've never made a mistake with me. That's our cry to God. You're so good. You're my beautiful strength. And you've never made a mistake with me. There are people in this room this morning who might not feel that. You might not feel that this morning. And that's okay. But the truth remains that God is bigger and more able than anything you can imagine. You are not too broken or too far from him for him to do a miracle in your life. And none of us are too healthy for him to take us to a deeper place of health and freedom. So God is doing a new and a good thing. There are a lot of ways for us to step into that and take some spiritual next steps today. One of the ways is what I've already talked about, by writing your prayers, posting them, or camping in them during these 21 days. You can participate on Tuesday nights and come to our prayer and praise services. You can join a small group or a freedom group, and I encourage you to do that. You can also join Growth Track this month. If you've not taken Growth Track, it's a great way to find out more about our church, to find out more about yourself and how God crafted you and designed you for great things, to find out where you might be called to serve or to grow or what's next for you as a believer. Those are just a few of the ways, but I just encourage you to do something tangible, do something different something to take you to the next level of where God wants to take you to be, something deeper. At this time, I'm just gonna ask that our hospitality team, our usher team, that you would start bringing forward the buckets. We're gonna be collecting our tithes and offerings. And I think actually that Taking this offering is really just another representation of what the Lord is doing this morning. Because really our lives are the offering, right? Our lives and what we've written on these papers and what we're going to be putting in these buckets as a financial offering, they're all just a way of us saying, hey God, I'm just a human. I'm just bringing you a human-sized offering, giving you a human-sized thing but I know that you can make God-sized things happen with what I give you this morning. So this is just another extension of our worship, an extension of what we're already doing. So I'm gonna pray a prayer of blessing over the offering and over what you've written on these papers and over what God is going to do. Lord Jesus, I thank you so much for your goodness, for your faithfulness, we worship you this morning and we just want to fall in line and partner with you in what you are wanting to do in this season of life, in this year at Turning Point. And God, I bless this morning's tithes and offerings and I bless the offering of our lives this morning. As we wrote on these papers, the areas in which we need more freedom, we need more Jesus to fill in the gaps, to fill in the holes, to fill in the brokenness and make them whole. God, we know that you can do it because we're just us, but you're you. And you can take small things and make big things happen. And so we trust you to do that, God. We trust you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.